My first scooter wheelchair died about 13 years ago. I had started using that scooter maybe 20 years earlier because of difficulties walking, because of multiple sclerosis. The scooter and I had rolled thousands of miles together and finally unable to walk. I relied on it entirely to get around. But that day I was nervous. It just didn't feel right. Nevertheless, I flew from Boston down to New Jersey to attend a meeting in Princeton. The scooter stopped dead on the New Jersey transit train platform at Newark Airport, never to roll on its own again. Conductors pushed me on my dead scooter onto the westbound train and pushed me off again at Princeton Junction. There, a man came up to me saying he saw I was in trouble and offering to help. My mind was racing and I wanted to be left alone to figure things out, but the man stayed with me for 45 minutes. That man was Michael. He uses a rehab power wheelchair, like the one I'm in today. His spastic arms tightly grip his chest, but his legs and feet are completely still. He immediately claimed kinship of one wheelchair user with another, saying he wasn't gonna leave until he knew I was safe. He gave me his home phone number in case I needed someone local. I never intended to call him. But the next day on the five hour drive back to Boston with my dead scooter, I kept thinking that man was really nice to stay with me. I should thank him. An online search the following day found the name Michael, his phone number and links to MS support groups. I emailed him and within several weeks we became great friends. He was born in Birmingham, England, nine days before I was born in Boston. His type of MS is worse than mine, but we share many MS experiences, and we like similar art and music. But what we both really value is being able to do what we can do, and we loved speeding around in our wheelchairs. <laughs> I took many trips down to visit Michael during ensuing years. It was about a 10-minute roll from my Boston office down to South Station in Amtrak. Michael's modest but completely accessible home is about a mile from the Princeton Junction train station. He lives there alone with paid home health aides who support his basic needs like feeding, bathing, and dressing. When I visited, I assisted however I could, did lots of organizing. But we also took trains into New York City and Philadelphia. We rode over the George Washington and Brooklyn bridges. We explored Central Park. I especially loved his mother, who exemplified resilience and grace and visited from England every year. But where I really could help Michael was with healthcare. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis during my first semester at medical school, 10 years before the Americans with Disabilities Act. I got my MD degree, but I faced brutal disability discrimination in medical school and I was unable to complete training to become a practicing physician. But I know my way around doctors and hospitals. And so when several months later, Michael had his first major health crisis, I became his healthcare proxy and tenacious advocate. I've spent countless numbers of days at Michael's hospital's bedside. Then COVID struck. When I got that 9 a.m. call on April 20th, 2020, from Tasanya, Michael's morning aide, saying that he looked sick and had a temperature nearing 102, my mind went momentarily blank. Then it kicked into its Michael serious health crisis mode. I couldn't train down. I'd have to do whatever I could from a distance. Tests later that day confirmed that Michael had COVID. Before then, Michael and I had talked a lot about his risk for getting COVID. Because he needs so much daily support, he couldn't isolate himself to stay safe. His risks of getting COVID were high. As his healthcare proxy, I needed to understand his preferences for care. Michael has long preferred that if his breathing or heart stops, that he be allowed to die, no resuscitation, Therefore, I knew he'd want to stay home when he got COVID. But making that happen was hard. Three amazing women agreed to help out. Nikki, Shelley, and Tasanya, like most home health aides, have second jobs fortuitously in healthcare. 
and they figured out some way to cover him 24-7. Over the weeks with COVID, Michael got really sick. He pleaded with me to stay on FaceTime with him for hours, just simply watching as he breathed. Although he wanted to stay home, he didn't want to die. And he pleaded with me through his COVID terror to reassure him that he would live. I kept telling him to breathe in and breathe out so that he would. By 10 p.m., I was exhausted, and I would tell his evening aide that I was signing off, that she knew where to reach me. A couple of nights, I was sure that 2 or 3 a.m. call would come, that Michael wouldn't live through the night. But he did. Michael turned the corner on May 2nd. He called me at 6.20 a.m. <laughs> his face aglow with a wide smile, telling me he intended to live. A minute or two later, he again looked ill and exhausted, but the seed of life was planted. Michael recovered fully from COVID. Sometimes it was emotionally numbing, watching for hours as he took each difficult breath, but this was something I could do for my friend. After all, many years earlier, he then a stranger had refused to leave me unable to walk, stranded on a train platform. Thank you.